dear, to recall Parliament at a vast public expense, offering members of Parliament up to £3,700 to fly back from their holidays to attend what was in effect a state eulogy for a party political figure, then fly back at public expense to their holidays. And I hope that IPSA will be releasing the figures of who claimed and what they claimed. This was a grotesque decision, totally unnecessary. Monday was the day when Parliament returned. Monday was the day when people could have made their tributes and uh, paid their tributes and made the points that they wished to make. That was the second problem. The state mourning the first, the recall, unnecessary recall, fantastically expensive recall of Parliament was the second. The muffling of the chimes of Big Ben was the third. The banning of Ding Dong was the fourth. And now we have this. Now we have this. The shadow leader of the House, rather politely, as is her wont, made the point that there's every belief in this House that this Prime Minister likes to avoid Prime Minister's question time. If he avoids it tomorrow, he will have avoided it for four weeks, four consecutive weeks. Now, I, I'm at every Prime Minister's question, so look, look, the, the honourable gentlemen, I must call them, opposite, I caution them again. People are listening to this debate and cackling like hyenas. This Thatcherite chorus over there would be better, would be better to show just a touch of sensitivity to the fact that there are millions of people in this country hate Margaret Thatcher and those who followed her. And the Prime Minister, if he dodges Prime Minister's questions tomorrow, will have dodged them for four consecutive weeks. Now, as Mr. Wilson said, a week's a long time in politics. Four weeks is a long time to miss Prime Minister's question, the only mass audience. I'd much prefer to give way to the Honourable Gentleman than for him to cackle and wobble his ample girth from a sedentary position. I'd much prefer to give way to him. Point of order. Point of order. Mr Jacob Rees-Mogg, if you would rule whether such terms of phrase are parliamentary. Yeah. The short answer to the honourable gentleman is that what has just been said was distasteful, but it was not disorderly. It does not seem to have evoked any great display of misery on the part of the honourable gentleman. But I know that the honourable member for Bradford West, when he comes to speak, will do so with a degree of calm and measurement of words for which I know in future years he will want, of course, to be renowned. Mr Alex Shelbrook. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and there was I under the impression that, he, that the Honourable Gentleman was a great orator. I'm sure the Honourable Gentleman, in, in context to his last comments, will agree and, and congratulate this Prime Minister for making sure that Parliament isn't gone for four months and indeed bringing the House back in September so that he can do those two sessions of Prime Minister's questions, which up until recently um, just didn't happen. That's, that's actually the best point that the Honourable Gentleman has made all evening. It just goes to show that points, that points made from one's feet are usually better than points made from a sedentary, indeed relaxed, position. It is a fair point that Parliament does not retire for the summer for as long as it did in our long period together, Mr Speaker, in the House of Commons. But facts are chills that win a ding, as we say in Scotland. Every Wednesday, the Prime Minister should stand at the dispatch box and face the music of everything that's happened in the previous week. And for four weeks it will have been the case that the Prime Minister has not done so. At a time when the British economy is in desperate trouble, the Prime Minister has not been able to be questioned about it. 
at a time when a budget has come and gone, which has been near universally regarded, welcomed, my goodness, I don't know where it was welcomed, certainly not by the financial commentators, certainly not by the markets, certainly not by the public, certainly not by the opinion polls, but the Prime Minister has not been able to be questioned about it. The Prime Minister has not been able to be questioned about anything for four weeks, neither domestic nor international, and our country is involved in very many, and you'll be very happy that I don't seek to dilate upon them, Mr. Speaker, but the country is involved in some very serious matters overseas also, and the Prime Minister has not been able to be questioned about them. And I just feel, and I think that the attendance here this evening indicates that there are many who feel, whether they're on the official opposition or not, there are many who feel that this has all gone too far, that an attempt at canonization of a person around whom there is, I see the speaker is frowning, I speak as a religious man, I'm not uh, against canonization where it's justified, but there has to be a consensus before one can be canonized and no such canonization is possible. Is from the back benches, which I think is rather unseemly, and members can't both cavil at what's being said and then make a raucous noise themselves. I simply say to the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Bradford West, that I wasn't frowning at him, I was listening attentively to him. Mr George Galloway. Thank you, sir. The point is that beatification, canonization, is something that can only happen when there is a consensus. There is no such consensus about the former Prime Minister. Yet people are acting, the state is acting, and the state broadcaster and now the parliamentary authorities are asking us to accept things which are too close to royal. You see, Mrs Thatcher famously had a slightly fraught relationship with the palace, and I can understand why. Mrs Thatcher may to many of the honourable gentlemen opposite have been great, but she was not to up to 60% of the electorate when she was alive, and according to the polls, more than 50% of the people now being polled are against her, were strongly against her, feel that she did bad things here and abroad. And it brings into discredit this kind of funeral, this kind of state occasion, if it's awarded in a way which many people in the country feel is unjustified and feel is being rammed down their throats for partisan reasons and ideological reasons and for which they're being asked to pay. And I caution, through you, Mr. Speaker, the establishment of which I suspect you're not fully regarded as a member, though you ought to be, because your office is one of the great offices in the land. But I, I say through you to this establishment that, 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 that you've gone too far. They have gone too far. There's been too much of this. It's too expensive. It's too elaborate. It's too regal. And many, many people in the country are unhappy about it. And I just feel that to compound all that I've tried to say, to compound it with effectively cancelling a vital part of British political life would be to compound, to add insult to the injury already suffered. My last point, <laughs> gentlemen and ladies, <laughs> although the, the, mis, the misbehaviour is coming exclusively from I think they're called gentlemen, uh, opposite. My, my point is this, Mr. Speaker, this funeral did not have to be organized so that it would clash with Prime Minister's question time. It could have been held today. It could have been held on Thursday. It could have been held later on Tuesday. 
The state was vitally involved in the organization of this funeral. We know that because we're paying for it. The state was vitally involved in the organization of it and it was them who organized a clash with Prime Minister's question. So why should the House of Commons be asked to accept the abrogation of its proper role tomorrow when the government is responsible for bringing about any clash insofar as there is one. But it's too late now to change the time of the funeral. It's not too late for the House to refuse to abandon its responsibilities at Prime Minister's questions. And I hope, if the House divides at the end of the evening on this, as I hope it will, that a decent number of Members of Parliament will reflect the feelings of, if not their own constituents, then the tens of millions of constituents of many of us here, and some of them there, who feel that the adoration of the Maggie has gone far enough.